If she's ready, I will invite Pamela Karimi up here to introduce our next two speakers. Thanks everyone for being here today. Allow me to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Robert Fisher, who's an assistant professor in the physics department at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth here, with research interests including computational and theoretical studies of thermonuclear or type 1A supernovae, giant uh, supernovae, giant molecular cloud, star and ground door formation, and astrochemistry. He began his career in California, uh, first earning his uh, BS in physics with honors at Caltech, where he was the Green Prize recipient. He earned his PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, where he held a NASA graduate student fellowship. He then did a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore, Livermore Laboratory, where he developed the first quantitative theory of the distribution of binary stars. Afterwards, he was a research scientist at the University of Chicago, where he led an international team of computer scientists, physicists, and mathematicians in the pursuit of simulations of turbulence on the world's largest computer at that time. In Chicago, he and his colleagues also made some back, uh, made, uh, made some breakthroughs on um, the problem of a thermonuclear or type 1A supernovae, which produced iconic movies and graphics which have been covered in media outlets around the world, including an episode of the universe on the History Channel. He and his colleagues were later honored for this work by the Department of Energy with a certificate of service. According to them, uh, this service was for leadership in advancing uh, the field of computational science and engineering by using high performance computing to elevate the understanding of the physical problems of nuclear uh, detonation and uh, turbulent mixing of complex multi-component fluids and other materials as represented by supernovae. He joined the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth in 2008, where he leads an active research group of graduate and undergraduate students. Our next speaker in this panel is Professor Harvey Goldman, who is a multidisciplinary artist he has created critically acclaimed work in the fields of ceramics, digital, Im digital imaging, and music. He was born in Chicago. Goldman received his BFA from the University of Illinois and his MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He teaches digital media in the design department at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth here, where he currently holds the position of Chancellor Professor of Design. He has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, and the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities. Goldman's work is included in numerous private and public collections, including the Iota Center for Visual Music, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Everson Museum of Art, the Cordova Museum, Courier Museum of Art, and the Crawford Art Museum. His work has been exhibited widely throughout the United States, as well as Amsterdam, Austria, Australia, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Romania, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey. Wow. Goldman's, Goldman's work has been selected for the 1995, 97, and 2001 uh, SIGGRAPH International Digital Art Exhibitions. His interests include gardening, storytelling, all genres of music and sound exploration, language development, writing systems, and basketball. Now, the reason why these two amazing individuals are placed in this panel is because um, they are collaborating on visualizing the science results of astrophysical simulations. And without further ado, I would like to invite them to talk to you about their own research as well as this collaborative effort that is taking place here at UMass Dartmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Green, for that excellent introduction. I hope I can go as long as the introduction was. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
it's my pleasure to be here today, and actually I think I'm really looking forward to this panel, and I hope we have a chance to, to sort of interact maybe with the audience as well as the chat a bit. And uh, that's actually one of the major reasons why I really am looking forward to this, is I wanted to sit down and talk again with our We have such a great time every time we sit down and talk. Um, but actually, I to, to, to start just uh, thinking about this a little bit broadly. Actually, I remember a couple of years ago, actually, at, uh, at your chancellor's board, from part of you, talking about the interaction of the arts and humanities and sciences, and why it is it seems that there are these times where uh, we have uh, more productive periods. Everyone thinks about like the, there was this great period in the early modern period, and there was maybe this great period in the 60s. Maybe maybe more recent periods too. We'll see the time. Why, why really is that? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really would love to hear what Harvey has to think about that too. But let me offer a couple of my thoughts before we talk about some of our collaboration directly. And I think it's actually kind of interesting. It's a little bit like I think it's almost like I think that these ideas uh, lead to a kind of uh, sharing of uh, uh, a brilliant idea of opportunity. And let me, let me start with a little anecdote. So from, this is from the science side. So there's a time when we didn't know about any planets outside of our own solar system. There's only uh, our own solar system. Today, uh, we know many, many others besides that. But about 20 years ago, there was the first, one of the first reported discoveries of a planet outside of our own solar system. It's a remarkable breakthrough. It's actually a discovery that made the most prestigious journal in the science world called Nature. And it was an amazing break. But there was only one small problem with this discovery. And that was that the planet that had supposedly been discovered turned out to have a period of rotation of one year, just like our own planet, which seems kind of remarkably peculiar, right? And it turned out this discovery wasn't actually a discovery at all. It was actually a mistake. <laughs> that the most obvious thing that happens as the Earth goes around the sun is that we're moving around the sun. And if you're looking for something else, you have to make sure you subtract out that motion that wasn't done there. So this great discovery was a fiasco. It was actually a failure. But other people turned out to once that discovery had made to look for other planets, and lo and behold, they were there. Right? We've actually you know, now we know many, many hundreds outside of our own solar system. So it might seem like just serendipity, but I think it's actually because uh, it's because there's we're still today we live in a time of opportunity. There's a lot of discoveries out there to be made in the humanities and arts, and creative activity and sciences. And uh, there's a spirit when other people are doing great things for you to sort of build on that as well. So I think that's that's one of uh, one reason why I think these time periods are going together. It's like that it's really being uh, emboldened by the spirit of opportunity by talking to other people in other fields that encourages you to also excel. So let, let me talk a little bit about uh, our own collaboration and show some other things that we've been up to and how arts and sciences sort of fit together in these sorts of ways, uh, and how we visualize things. Well, Harvey and I have been working together on this interesting project. The project uh, is basically dealing with scientific results, scientific visualizations, but we're doing things that are perhaps we want to visualize those results in a different way. And when we're, we have the science results, that shows calculations are sort of showing things in one way, but sometimes when you're visualizing things, you want to show things accurately enough that you're depicting them, but you're not, uh, you may have to sort of show things and visualize things in an accurate way, but a creative way. And that's where sort of I think the arts and sciences can merge together here. But let me show you an example. This is, this is something from my own work. Uh, this is a movie. Let me put the movie up here. And uh, let me, before I show the movie, let me just tell you what this movie is about. This is a movie that I did uh, with my colleagues in Chicago. Um, 
So what this is going to show is it's going to show an explosion of a star. Okay, so a star like our sun, but most stars are not quite like our sun. They have other companion stars uh, that orbit near them. And it turns out that for stars like our sun, at the end of their lifetimes, they'll wind up as sort of retirees. They're not going to be burning any more fuel. They just sort of go to the retirement hotel where they just are living off their savings account. And not their bank savings, but their, the energy that they've burned over their entire lifespan. So they're called white dwarfs. They're no longer active. They're no longer burning nuclear fuel. But it turns out if there's one of these companion stars in their neighborhood, they can pull in enough mass to sort of come out of retirement, start burning again. And in some cases, they're so successful in this burning, they explode completely. Right? <laughs> we call these thermonuclear supernovae. And they're amazing, amazing things to look at. But let me show you a visualization, a movie, of how one of these uh, stars will explode. So let me, let me just start it a little bit to show what this looks like at the beginning. Okay, let me, let me pause it right there just to, to show you what it is that we're looking at. So th this is the star itself right here. That's the white dwarf. And we're seeing here the outer edge, right? And it turns out that from one of these stars, getting near close to the edge of its um, lifespan, it's kind of burning. Started, it's reinvigorated, right? So it's burning, and it's burning, you can see, before. Now, when I say it's burning, what I mean, I don't mean like a candle, although in some ways it is a little bit like a candle. The candle burns, but it burns through a chemical process. These stars burn through a nuclear process. The key difference is it's a lot more energy than the flame. Even though in some respects it does behave a lot like a flame. It actually is a flame as well. It's called a flame. So this little bubble starts off in the center. Okay? So let me play a little bit more. So what you can see is that the bubble's a little bit offset from the center, and it starts to fly. It's just like a balloon, right? Because it's a little bit less dense than its surroundings, and it rises. As it rises, it kind of comes up out of the surface. And then here it bursts out of the surface. Okay? And you see this stuff, this, this flame, we call it actually the ash of the flame, and it comes out of the surface. Okay, and here you can kind of see it wrapped around. In a second, you'll see what I, what I mean when we're talking about how do you do things creatively. Because immediately you got this problem, even in visualizing something like this. Because as ash is coming around the surface, you can't see what's going on inside anymore. So you've got a little bit of a problem. You have to somehow, you don't want to contort the science. You don't want to distort what you're seeing. But you want to make it visible. Right? You want to make sure that you can understand what you're looking at. So what's actually done here is even though that ash is really still there, tweak the map just a little bit so that you can see what's going on underneath it. That's really hard to do. When we were doing this visualization, this took us like months to do, to get that. Because you do anything sort of scientifically by just by a clear map and you think you can't see anything, just being muck. So that's that's kind of one challenge that you kind of face when you're doing this kind of creative merging of science and art, right? So how do you show things accurately, but in the way that's intuitive and it's depicting what the uh, what really we want to understand. Okay, so to move on, here's this uh, nicely revealed uh, white dwarf, which is swelled up in size, but it's not exploding. And the thing to look at here is that the stars are continuing to expand, but it hasn't completely blown itself to bits yet. And if you look, this is the part where the bubble had broken out. If you look 100 degrees opposite of that, on the other side, you can start to see something really interesting happening. This star kind of sits there, it kind of reaches its maximum expansion, but it's not disrupted, it's not unbound, it contracts back in. And then right there on the point opposite of the breakout, you can see this kind of interesting point. This is when that ash has sort of pushed its way inward. And this is also part of this, is that the time and space has to change a little bit. To really see this, you have to put a little bit of time and space. You have to sort of say, well, let's pause it here. Let's actually rotate it around so we can see what happens. So that's the point of detonation. 
that's when this burning becomes an explosion, and you have to sort of pause it there because it goes so quickly, you don't see it if you blink. And at that point, you also change scale, you play with space a little bit, and the star is blown itself apart. It's no longer entirely developed. Now it's, I guess, it's, uh, it's off the uh, social security rules. Right, so that's, that's, that's kind of like some of the challenges we deal with. And uh, I, I don't know if you also talk maybe some more about our collaboration as well, but it's interesting that I think when we're, when we're dealing with our collaboration, it's a slightly different project. We face a lot of the similar kinds of, of uh, challenges. How do, we, how do we show things that are realistic that depict the science, but somehow uh, capture the science accurately? And a lot of the things we look at are sort of, there are, we're showing them as if they were visible to the eye, but really these are things which are all invisible to the eye. So really what we're doing is we're making the what's unseen visible. And that's another major challenge in what we do. Maybe Harvey, you can come up and talk a little bit about what you're doing. up to and I hope I'm to have a chance to sort of yeah, yeah. 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 questions for you. So when Robert uh, contacted me, I was already aware a little bit of his work, just because uh, I knew that he was a uh, partner of one of our art history professors, and uh, I had done a little research and was just so flattered to get the phone call and the interest to do a collaboration. So we started the process, of, what I want to talk a little bit about is the process of collaborating, because I've been involved in, over the years in a lot of different collaborations. I come from a family that has some, a lot of science in the background, but uh, I had no idea about physics uh, and what Robert was working on, so I thought it was extremely attractive that I, I could learn something new. So we started with a number of meetings in, the, in this library over coffee uh, with a lot of pencil sketches like doodles, like you might do on the side of your notebook on a napkin. And took all of these doodles that Robert was doing home and you know started working on sketches, and the process kind of evolved where. I would do a few things and send them to Robert. Robert's working with a team of other physicists who are up at Harvard. And he would send them to them, and everybody would give some feedback, and then we'd go to another reiteration. And the project is still in the middle, actually. The research is changing as, as we're talking, which makes it even more exciting to me. But uh, that process of, 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 of discussing and communicating, what I find that makes a successful collaboration is the, the collaborator's ability to have empathy and see the project from someone else's point of view, not just from the artist's point of view or the science, but really try to understand what each other are trying to do when they're doing so. So communication skills are probably the highest order. And when a, when a, when a high-end scientist is talking to an artist, it really forces them to uh, simplify things in a way that they're sure the artist understands. And a lot of things I didn't understand, but I nodded my head because I knew we had <laughs> Limited time, and I still find myself nodding my head a little bit every so often. But uh, but I'm learning a great deal. So I'm going to show you a few of the uh, images that are in midstream. So and, and one of the one of my more uh, one of the nice mistakes that I got to feedback on if I can get these to all the same people in one voice. So this is sort of the related project. Uh, so I remember we were talking about white dwarfs earlier. So the project we were working on here is what would happen, and what would happen if one of these white dwarfs, which actually remarkably enough these are known to harbor leftover remnants of planetary systems, including asteroids, comets, and so on. Right? So we see them. We see the sort of stuff settle down on the surface. Of what actually, how does this stuff actually get there? How does an asteroid or a comet come by? And what happens if it were to actually come by close enough to impact the white world? And so 
we're working on the signs, and also to have some visualizations because the signs may be just a, a bunch of equations, right? What does it actually look like? So Harvey did these spectacular uh, renderings of how this process would look like, right? And we're looking at the sequence of these. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the one thing, so what we're basically seeing here is the white dwarf, that's the blue object, which is also, it's kind of hard to depict. I mean, it's really, it's whitish, blue, but we, we have other colors. Whitish is hotish, bluish is actually most hot. So we have the white dwarf is there, and then you get this object coming by, and it's sort of, it's a comet, and it sort of comes by on its final journey, and on the way in, it gets sort of ripped apart, and uh, you know, it impacts and it produces an event that we can probably see in the telescope. <coughs> Impact. What I what I've been talking about on the first image was uh, oh, looking at it is the first the first, uh, oh, that meant, uh, the first image that I created for this. I, I was pretty happy with it. Though. Wow, that looks pretty cool. And, uh, and then I started getting feedback, and I realized that I didn't know anything about what happened when the comet. Its tail got close to us, a white dwarf. So this, can anybody see the difference in this image and the one that we just looked at a moment ago? Uh, so uh, the main difference is not this image, but oops, this image is, you see how the tail is facing a different direction. So Robert can tell you why that's happening. The comet has two tails. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something like that. You, you, you know, it's, uh, and it's something which you, don't always appreciate like it because it has two tails. One is dust in one's eyes, right? But really, when you see it in a telescope, it, one might be so dim you don't see the second one. One always points away from the sun, right? The other one is kind of curved. So, you know, so we're, we're visualizing this, and so and actually, but the point is also you're kind of pushing the science a little because we're seeing comets around our sun. No one has ever seen a comet around a white dwarf, but we can reasonably infer that's. Probably what it would look like. I guess. Yeah, I, I was assuming that when I, when I was told it was facing the formation, that maybe there were pressures from the sun that were pushing the tail away as it got closer. That's exactly the way it works. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like what I'm trying to get at is that through doing a collaboration, I'm learning a little science, which is fun. This is uh, right after impact, and then this will eventually, because I'm finished, but this, this will eventually be uh, the last image of the sea. One of the things that's so I'll talk a little bit. Uh, I'm curious about this. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's, I mean, yeah, this is what like Harvey was saying. It, it's it's lighting up, right? But how it lights up, what it looks like, it's it is also it's really hard to depict, right? Because I mean, we don't exactly know right, exactly what that looks like. But it's it's uh, a lighting of the white light. So it's actually it's, really, it's like some of these are, are challenging things to depict because the, the the details are not always known scientifically. Yeah. And Which I love because it gives me a lot of artistic freedom. He doesn't know what it looks like either, so. <laughs> which, which really is, is great. <laughs> um, sure, I'll talk a little bit more. One of the things, just about, I'd like to talk a little bit about collaboration in general. So, uh, the don't. In our, one of the earlier panels presented by this, uh, actually I think our moderator at the beginning, uh, Lauren, talked a little bit about what sometimes people feel are two distinct domains, science and art. And um, I've been very interested in uh, researching you know, the relationships of those two and realizing that over time, uh, as time history has gone on, there were points in history where there were many, many, many artist scientists that were not a separation in the culture. The Renaissance is a perfect example, and, and the very most well-known example is uh, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci. But there are many throughout history of scientists who look through microscopes. Heckel is a great exam example of a German scientist who just did beautiful drawings. Charles Darwin took drawing classes before he went on the voyage of the uh, Eagle came back with these beautiful uh, profiles of, of birds. Uh, and, and literature and history is scattered uh, with examples of that. But what started to happen is that uh, 
disciplines became more and more specialized, and they became more and more distinct, and it became harder for that to happen for one reason or another. And uh, I find it kind of sad, but I, but I find that we're in a period of time where that's starting to change again. And a lot of, uh, what's your name again? A lot of what Kelsey was talking about in terms of uh, you know, the revitalization of using uh, digital media or te new technology is uh, kind of the impetus a little bit behind some of what's happening in the arts today because uh, artists are made so accessible to technology. But one of the things I, I'd like to think about is, is well, first, you know, the, the two domains, the, the place where they overlap, I like to think of that as the wonder domain, where, where you have magic and wonder. And the more time you spend in the world of wonder leads, in many cases, to wisdom. So that's uh, kind of a special place. And, and it's sprouting up in universities, our ideas lab being one, but the University of Chicago, or the University of Chicago as well, has an amazing collaboration project with artists and scientists. The CERN Collider in Switzerland has a project where anybody, any artist you guys should apply, you know, can go. And just the idea there is not to do art that fulfills the scientist's needs, and not to do science and arts, but to just be inspired by what you're around and then create your own work. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that. Um, I have some thoughts about uh, how often we think about how scientists have influenced our, our work, our technology. So the examples we looked at today were like 3D printing, which comes from a scientific technology background, how that influences the arts. Really the invention of uh, early pigments may have been more of a science, and then artists used it. But technology is usually more in the science domain than the art domain, or at least it was thought of. <clears throat> and uh, I see some of that in my own field, uh, changing a great deal. Like I try to think of examples. Can anybody think of examples in the audience where artists influenced scientists to change? It's easy to think of scientists who were helpful for artists. We've seen a lot of examples, and it's constant. Can you think of the other way? Anybody have a thought? Yes? Uh, early uh, stained glass was commissioned by the, uh, you know, the church and everything. They were actually uh, they were actually chemists doing like nanomaterial science. Uh, right. You know, like uh, rose colored glass is actually nano gold. Well, you know, they were doing a renaissance. So is that the scientists helping the arts or the arts helping the scientists? I think it's they were scientists being artists. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of that. I'm trying to think of examples where the artists actually had a big impact on the science. Jonas. Jonas. I can't hear it back there. Uh, we got a mic though. And please put your in if you have a response. The Oculus Rift uh, devices like it have been influenced by artists who come up with new ideas based on concept, and their new ideas require the scientists to come up with new things that they weren't planning on for that. Exactly. Device. That's a perfect example, and that's something that I've been involved for the last 25 years in digital media. And I've seen the first computers we had come demo on campus that were art-making computers. You know, they cost about fifty dollars to $100,000 for one computer. They were horrible. They were black and white. They made little chunky squares. And that technology evolved because of the demand by artists and visualizers <clears throat> for better technology. So you see that, therefore, artists were affecting the technology which was used you know, now I'm the president. What we just looked at in uh, Robert's uh, simulation is another example where scientists needed to visualize this kind of tool. And, so, and because the scientists were working, and, and, and I consider computer scientists scientists, <clears throat> you know, were developing this so that they could do this, all of a sudden that is something that's now in every 3D program. There's, there's the ability to create dynamic simulations, which was unheard of five or ten years ago. So the back and forth of, of, of not just uh, ideas but demand is, is, is uh, 
pretty interesting. And uh, one of the things that I, well, let me make sure I don't forget something I do want to talk about before I go on to that. Uh, good enough. Let me go over the presentation a little bit of some slide issues, some images. How are we doing for time? How many minutes? So I'll stop after 10 minutes so we can have 20 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, does this work? So this is from a, a different presentation. So I'm going to uh, just jump around in here and uh, show you some stuff. Here. So uh, this is a from from a little talk that I. Uh, <coughs> Pamela referenced uh, that I gave at the Chancellor's Colloquium, which most of you were not at, but uh, I was thinking a lot about the last time there was a huge change where science influenced the arts. And I was thinking about something that was going on in the 1900s, and it, not only the arts, our entire culture. <clears throat> and it wasn't just science influencing the arts, but it was a lot, a lot had to do with science, I believe. So pre the 1900s, this is some of the kinds of artwork that we might have seen Rembrandt, uh, a lot of you have seen this in your art history books. Uh, oops. Constable. Then all of a sudden, around the 1900s, you know, onto the scene bursts this uh, in, this idea of impressionism. Uh, look at some of the Monet, uh, Seurat. Uh, one of the interesting scientists at this time was a man named. Rude, who actually developed the theory that if you put two colors next to each other and stand back a little ways, your eye mixes those colors. Now it happens that uh, Paul Signac, who was one of the impressionists and pointillists, was neighbors with this guy and kind of was very influenced <coughs> by the science. So the relationship between science and art, in, in this case, is kind of interesting. As an aside, we've got cubism, so we've got this breaking up of little things uh, going on. Duchamp's new. In literature, we've got the development of uh, Gertrude Stein and James Joyce changing the whole way uh, books were written and thought about, little segments of ideas and thoughts and blips and beeps. In science, we have uh, this amazing uh, development in the early mid 1800s of you know these Victorian uh, moving the animation devices that created animation, and then we have this amazing man who was when I first saw his work, Marais, I thought he was an artist, an artist photographer, and uh, he ha had earlier developed uh, machines that uh, could make visible the invisible, so your blood pressure, you know, you have a, something that would track internal body fluids and things like that, and then draw up the other drugs. So today's electrocardiograms, uh, lie detectors, all come from his research. He also developed uh, the first movie camera based on a rifle shooting uh, film th through. And some of his images, these are the ones that I thought for sure, you know, he, I liked his work much more than uh, Mybridge. And Mybridge, you know, is in the art category in, in, in most of society. But these are just, he's, he was a scientist studying motion. He was also uh, really keen on fashion. <laughs> the little dots represent the shoulders and the joints, and the lines represent the bones. And these are the kind of images he got when he photographed these people moving in dark rooms. <laughs> Today's motion capture technology is derived directly from this. Physics and chemistry, which I should let Robert talk more about, but in the early, you know, until the 1900s, the atom, since the time of Lucretius, 50 BC, you know, people, he was the first one to write about uh, the atom being the universal building block, and it was indivisible. That was the definition. All of a sudden, in the 1900s, people started to research breaking apart of the atom. <clears throat> and we get a whole lot of very interesting results. This guy was able to discover electrons. Albert Einstein breaking light into particles, okay? And uh, Max Planck. In industry, at the same time, it's all happening at the same time. In industry, we have the Industrial Revolution going on, where Raymond Olds and uh, 
support for developing mass production techniques and the assembly line. So, what's the relationship between that time period and what's happening now? There's a lot of, of stuff I find written that, that same similar pose. Every, some people say every 100 years something interesting like this happens, but I think you're very fortunate to be young and living at this time where the sciences and the arts are influencing each other back and forth uh, so much. So it's, uh, it makes for exciting collaboration. So I think I've said a little bit all about what I want to say about that. And uh, Robert, do you want to say anything else before we take questions? Sure. Yeah. I was just wondering, do, do you think Bubbles or Fuller is a scientist oh. or an artist? He's a, he's a boat. He's a boat, yeah. Because I was thinking about the question. I think to me, that he's probably, oh, I don't think Agnes has a scientist. I think more as an artist or more as a scientist. <laughs> but I think he's probably one person I would think of as someone who had an impact on science. And so you have this concept of these structures uh, that he developed uh, for architecture and then became uh, actually uh, discoveries at the atomic scale, so called uh, buckyballs and fuller means of combinations of Maybe we should uh, open it up for questions. See if I can Also about a Pamela Karimi brought an interesting uh, lecture to the university last year or two years ago on talk about Islamic tiles, and there it was mathematicians influencing art. You know, it was just these mind blowing patterns that were intricately patterns within patterns within patterns that if you look at it, you could not dream how could somebody figure this out. And, uh, the early Persian temple, temples that are formed with these um, ceramic uh, decoration. These are very interesting. So these are called pop up. I'm like, I'm pop up. Basically, <laughs> uh, when you make a tile, plus you just take a bunch of squares, right? That's a very simple tile. But it turns out there's also a very strange kind of tile that where it's called aperiodic. You basically have these structures that basically it's not just blocking one after the other. It's very complicated, very intricate geometric construction in uh, the West. What they're called Penrose tiles, and the Roger Penrose was this British mathematician um, still alive, right? So he did sort of in the 50s and 60s. So he was thought to be the first person ever right, to do these constructions. And then it turns out, uh, through field work, uh, that he wasn't the first person, not by hundreds of 
research scientist at Harvard, he actually went to Central Asia for the first time in his life, uh, and he was walking around, and he noticed these convoluted star patterns on the facades of the mosques, the Islamic mosques in Central Asia. And he became interested in studying these patterns. Um, and he discovered that there is one pattern on uh, the top of the main door of uh, uh, the Imam Mosque, the city of Isfahan that was built in the 15th century. Um, and he discovered that over there, the star patterns actually follow the same model that this scientist uh, uh, wrote, uh, um, basically, um, uh, discovered, or what, what is the? He didn't discover. He basically came up with the idea of the, invented the Penrose tiling um, and, and, and Peter Liu proved that this was actually something that had happened before in the 15th century. People were, people were aware of it. And this was a very interesting discovery. I think that the article was published in a 2007 issue of Nature, one of the issues in 2007. And uh, um, I thought it was a very interesting observation and very interesting discovery. And then again, uh, another episode of interesting um, interesting uh, way of looking at art, interesting way of looking at design from the perspective of a scientist. So architecture is a great example of a, of a merger of uh, mathematics and science kind of thinking in art. Uh, Memory Holloway asked an interesting question, which is the perfect example of, of how new technology gets invented. You know, we talk about printing food, how do you print food? You know, what a great thought. And, you know, now all of a sudden maybe we'll get technology, you know, the people involved in the printing. There's a, there's a guy here who prints skin at UMass. He, he, he actually puts skin cells into uh, inkjet cartridges and is able to print thin layers of skin and they're used for skin bracket. So uh, it's using art making printing technology, image making technology, converted for medical purposes. So the, the, the collaboration possibilities are just so rich and dense, and I think it's, when I came here, uh, I've been here for 30, this is my 36th year at UMass Dartmouth, and when I first came, there was like this schism between the arts and the sciences, and the art students would come back with their heads down after going to science class, the science students would make them feel bad about not being so smart, and not, you know, and the art students would make the scientists feel bad about you know, being geeks, and it was, it, was, it was this kind of animosity, and you know, now we have this studio, we have a conference like this, but there's so much happening, and it's not just here, it's in the air. It's like what I believe was happening in, 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 in the air at, at, at the time of the 1900s, when the atom uh, was split, and uh, it's a, a very exciting time period. Other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, I've always been talking about Can I I want to ask, I think you hit the nail on the head is, is that that is what's going on. There was an article written, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, is the MFA, Masters in Fine Arts, the new MBA, because so many companies are realizing that what's missing in their comp competitiveness is creativity. And that artists you know, have this amazing <coughs> resource that can be added. If they think I was, I was reading in, in preparing for this talk a lot about science artists who have collaborated. And what a lot of scientists do is they bring artists into the studio 
to follow their line of thought because they, they say, I tend to, I was trained to think so linearly, and there's all these side routes, and I was taught that a good scientist closes those routes off and focuses, and that when I bring artists in, they want to take all these side routes, and it leads to some interesting discoveries. So uh, maybe you've had some of those experiences. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. I think uh, I think it's uh, there's a there's a lot of, uh, of uh, possibilities and opportunities there. I think also it's uh, in terms of um, in terms of sort of uh, creative output. interested in that aspect of, just, of info, you know, visualizing information, Edward Tufte is, is, the, is the one to look at first, the workshops uh, around the world uh, on information and visualization. I had the opportunity, I have a brother who's a scientist who works on how cells regenerate themselves after they're injured, and it was invited, to, he got a grant to uh, have an animation made that it was able to explain his research visually. So I'm very much into and want to do more health-related uh, animation. So, I tell people the field, and this goes back to your question in the arts. I find that there's no if, if you're will, if you're if you just want to make art, that's great. You know the art that, and I shouldn't say just. If you want to make art for yourself, or that expresses your own emotions, that's great. I do that for myself. But the opportunities in terms of working and collaborating with other aspects of the world are so vast. I can't think of. One field, I was asking, uh, maybe you guys, that should be a question instead of a, where the arts couldn't help another area. And it, the only one that was thrown back to me, I, was, I gave this to a board of trustees, uh, to, or some kind of a smaller group, group, not one we were at, but another group, and they said, well, what about uh, financial investing? And, and I said, well, maybe you got me there. But, 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 but you know, if you think about you know, trial lawyers with animations of cars, in accidents, or even the Javon Martin trial, where they had animations of what was happening and which weren't allowed into the courtroom, or uh, you know, engineer any kind of engineering, any kind of uh, storytelling. Now, books all have elements, especially children's books, literature with animations and visuals. So, uh, it's the field is very wide open. Uh, I don't see any, any anything stopping you from doing well. It's just your creativity and how far you push yourself. Those are the real limitations in life. Thank you. There's a whole group sitting back here who are Vermeer specialists who have been looking at optics and lenses, and I cannot get them to ask a question. But they have told me the question they would like to know is. Well, there, there are three parts to this. If one of you can speak about 17th century Dutch invention in optics, 
the camera obscura, and if you count, it's all right. It's just bringing up the point. But the idea that Vermeer was able to see so lucidly has to do with the fact that the Dutch were grinding lenses, making microscope. They know all of this, but they're sitting back here and they won't say it. And uh, they were making telescopes. They were making nautical instruments, which had to do with vision and visuality and optics. That's one, that's one part of the question. The other is, Harvey brought up something very interesting, which is the way in which art can serve science. But let me give something um, on a, a personal level, how science absolutely informs art. And that is, a few years ago I walked across the lawn and I did physics, I did meteorology with Amit Tandon. Why? Because I wanted to know how clouds work. Clouds are such an extraordinary thematic in, in art. Thomas Cole has a painting where the clouds come from the west. Why do they look that way? And then I thought of Ansel Adams. So science can so totally inform the way we understand what actually happens, not symbolically only, but also what happens in the paint. Why does it look this way? There's a third part, and one of them is standing next to me, and that is that Pamela and I both live with scientists. The, the energy and the discussion is so interesting over dinner, and it's because we bring these two things together. I could hear it in Pamela's question or her observation about the stars on the Imam uh, Mosque. So um, we all speak and need so, so much to talk to one another. And I'm sorry that not one of these students back here will ask a question about lenses, but they're dying to know if you can answer it. Okay, I know that was a very, very long question to answer, but if you could keep it to five minutes or so, because we're, we really have to move on. I apologize about that. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Sunday's Neil deGrasse's uh, Cosmos series was all about light. So if you want to know about light, and he hypothesized through visualization that even the early caves may have had small pinholes that light came in from the outside, and some of these drawings on the caves were actually, caves were actually functioning as cameo, camera obscures. This was totally hypothetical, but it was an, interest, it's an interesting theory in their great show about uh, lenses and optics. And did your class study Tim's Vermeer? Do you know the movie yeah, Tim's we Vermeer? Are. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you know, Vermeer's uh, optics, David Hockney came up with a theory that, uh, 10 years ago that some of these things at that time period could not have been drawn without the use of lenses and projection devices. And it was poo pooed like crazy from the art history world. And now there's a, another scientist who's actually made his own Vermeer using the lenses. And <clears throat> he was so fanatical about not wanting to be proven wrong that he made the entire room with, 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 like he made a mandolin that he drew with wood from the same time period. He ground his own lenses, he did everything, and then he painted the room using the optics. So uh, it's an interesting hypothesis uh, and an interesting question memory. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it was fun. Okay.